All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> Welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Eat Move, Think, the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought, brought to you, you by Megan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. Have you been outside? Oh my gosh, I have. It's a gorgeous day out. The sun is bringing me to life. It's so nice to not have to wear not only a winter jacket, but like going outside in a polo shirt is pretty amazing. So did you think about wearing sunscreen today on a particularly sunny day? I did not. I'm not a big sunscreen wearer, at least in Toronto when I'm in Toronto. Well, some of us need to be more careful than others when it comes to sunscreen, but it is true that virtually everyone needs sunscreen. So is that wait, is that true? Because once I start thinking about it, I have a lot of questions about sunscreen, like SPF, right? What does SPF actually mean? Yeah. How much sunscreen do you actually need? Like some people lather it on. How much is the right amount? Or in the summer when it's super overcast, do you need sunscreen then? Very few guys I know would ever wear a sunscreen on their face on a typical day, unless they're at the beach or something or on a boat. Should they? Right. I it's a good that. question. Yeah. Well, these are the types of questions that we'll be tackling in today's episode, which I really think should be called everything you ever needed to know about sunscreen. Amazing. You like it? Yeah. Let's done. do it. I'm Jazz. I'm Chris. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think. And in this episode, I'll be sitting down with Dr. Jonathan Levy. He's the medical director of Refine by MedCan. That's their dermatology clinic. And I'm going to be asking him about the biggest misconceptions out there about sunscreen. And he'll give you all advice on the type, the amount, and the frequency at which you should all be wearing sunscreen. Before we get to the episode, we should also probably mention that MedCan offers dermatology services both in downtown Toronto yes. as well as in Oakville. You can learn more about your skin type, learn about different different kinds of treatments that could work for you. And they're also really gorgeous clinics. I'm eager to have all my questions answered. I'm going to listen to this episode with interest. Okay, let's bring in Dr. Levy. Welcome, Dr. Levy. It's really nice to have you here. Thanks for having me, Jasmine. It's also Rosacea Awareness Month this month. So Dr. Levy, why don't we start with that? Can you just break down a little bit about what rosacea is in honor of Rosacea Awareness Month? Sure. So rosacea, it's a very common skin condition. I'll see this a few times a day. It's where people get some redness in their face, most commonly on the cheeks, but it could affect the nose, forehead, chin, and they tend to get blushing or flushing. So they can have some background redness at baseline. And then with certain triggers, they can get more flushing where things get even redder. And more topical for this podcast, one of those triggers is UV ray exposure. So being out in the sun. And so how would you know if you have rosacea? If you have these little broken blood vessels and just background redness on mm. the inside part of your cheeks, then that's rosacea. Sometimes rosacea could also present with uh, pimples. And oh. so they tend to get pimples in those areas specifically. So there's a bit of overlap with acne, but it could present with pimples in those uh, areas. And along with that, with the background redness, they can also get that flushing where with certain triggers, whether it's sometimes red wine, spicy food, hot oh. liquids, UV radiation, yeah. that sort of stuff can make things temporarily more red. So any tips for someone who's dealing with rosacea? Are there medications or certain things they can do? Yeah, so there's lots of things that could be done. So first for general measures before we even get to treatment. So general measures would be preventing triggers. So if you know, hey, every time I have red wine, spicy food, something like that, avoid it. That being said, all the good things, a lot of the good things in life tend to trigger it. So it's more just knowing what's going to cause it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that, hey, if you don't want to get more red, you can mm -hmm. avoid it in certain situations or social situations. Okay. Moisturizing is important because just hydration in the skin helps. Yeah. And then protecting yourself from the sun, from UV radiation. So wearing sunscreen when you're outside will help as well. When it comes to treatment itself, broadly, there's creams, there's pills, and there's lasers. So often we'll start off with creams, prescription creams, and there's different ones depending on how it presents and what's been tried before. In more severe cases, we'll treat with a low-dose antibiotic mm. and... Um, then there's also laser. So people just have the background redness. They got these bigger broken blood vessels. The creams and pills, they're only going to work to a certain degree. They can't get rid of the redness. And that's where we do laser. And sometimes it's a combination of all that. 
You know, it, it could be just a cream, sometimes just laser, mm -hmm. cream and laser, cream pill and laser. So um, uh, treatment is tailored to the individual based on their symptoms. Well, it's nice to know that there's a lot of treatment because I don't know how much people know in general about rosacea and that there are things you can do to make that redness go away. So that's really great. So whether or not you have rosacea, sunscreen is obviously very important. We're getting into the yes. warmer months right now. I'm very excited for summer. I'm sure you are too. But before we get into summer, should we be wearing sunscreen in the meantime? Like when it's cloudy out, when the weather is not quite as hot as those summer months, do we need to be wearing sunscreen? So two different situations there. So one is the, there is UV radiation coming from the sun all year round. It's not as strong right. in the winter, right? You don't see that UV, uh, a high UV index yeah. rating um, in the winter time, but we still are getting sun and every little bit of sun, you know, can be damaging to our skin. So do you need to put on SPF 50 in the winter if you're in Canada? No, I don't think you need that winter time, but still wearing SPF will help. And when it comes to cloudy, so let's say it's summertime, it's totally overcast, mm -hmm. the sun's not coming out today, you think, I don't have to wear sunscreen, right? No, but that's wrong. So the if it's an overcast day, yeah. you'll get 30% of the amount of UV radiation will penetrate the clouds. So you think, oh, it's 30%, it's only one third. Yeah. That's the equivalent of wearing SPF 3. Whoa. Yeah, exactly, okay. right? So. If anyone in the summer, you've said, oh, it's a sunny day. I'm just going to put my sunscreen on SPF 3. No way, right? That's yeah. too low. So yeah. you still need to wear sunscreen and protect yourself from the sun on those cloudy days. So it's like SPF 15 all right for, for the wintertime? Or would you still always go for 30 or up? I think it depends on what type of skin someone has, you know, how much sun damage they've had in the past. But I'd say 15 to 30 in that range mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. be good. Okay, so let's get into you know, the concept behind what sort of rays, what the sunscreen is protecting you from. Well, there are UV rays, but those are broken up into UVA rays and UVB rays. What's the difference between those? So it stands for ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. There's actually ultraviolet C as well, UVC, oh. but those get blocked out by the ozone layer in our atmosphere. Okay. So they're actually the most damaging, but they do not penetrate down to the surface of the earth. So we don't have to worry about those. Great. All of this is on a spectrum. So just like we have visible light, so visible light is 400 to 700 nanometers. UVB is 290 to 320 nanometers. Okay. And from 320 to 400 is the UVA spectrum. So the lower the, the wavelength there, right? So the lower the number, 290, 320 is UVB. Those are, that's more damaging. It's stronger. Okay. So when we talk about SPF, SPF is talking about blocking UVB, not UVA. Oh. Specifically. So how do you make sure you're covering both? Good question. So you want to, on the bottle, it should, it should say broad spectrum. That means it protects you from UVA and UVB. Yeah. Maybe decades ago, it yeah. may not have covered, like they weren't so good at covering UVA. Wow. Which was still damaging our skin. Not as bad, but it still is. But pretty much most of the sunscreens you'd buy here will cover both. That's great. And so UVA rays penetrate deeper than UVB rays. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Good to mm -hmm. know. So while we're talking about UV rays, every day the weather report will give you an idea of the UV index. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about what sort of precautions I should be taking depending on the UV index that day? Yeah. It, you know, we've been talking a lot about sunscreen so far, but sunscreen is almost a last resort because sunscreen implies your skin is being exposed to the sun, mm -hmm. right? So what are measures you can take first? Well, it's, you know, wear a hat, sunglasses, long sleeves. And I mean, some of that you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense, right? But also on the flip side, you're kind of like, it's summertime, right? Yeah. I'm gonna, I mean, me, do I wear long sleeve clothes all day? No, you know, I'll be out, you know, and you can be out uh, at the beach or on the lake or something like that. So summertime, the UV index is just high, right? Whether it's, it's seven high. or eight or nine or 10, you know, it's high, right? It's a strong sun. Let's say you went outside 
any time in the summertime, regardless of what the UV index was. If you're prone to getting sunburns, you know, mm-hmm. you'll get a sunburn, whether the UV index is a little lower or higher. Right. Because um, the sun is just stronger then. Right. It's just on those days where it's higher, you got to be extra careful. Maybe go further than sunscreen and wear that hat, wear the long sleeves. Exactly. Go, to, go into shade. Right. Right. Yeah. So shade. So I tell people, you know, you're going to be at the beach, just sit under an umbrella. Yeah. You know, you could still be outside and see the ocean and all that, but, you know, sit in the shade. Other things, the UV index is the sun is strongest from ballpark about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay. So... Let's say you're going to be doing an activity. You're going to be going for a run or a walk or sailing or something. If you can do that activity outside of those hours, all else being equal, Mm -hmm. better to do it, say, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. or later in the afternoon when the sun isn't as strong. Okay, good tips. Good to know. So let's say it's summertime. What am I looking for? Am I buying spray sunscreen? Should I buy cream sunscreen? What's the difference between those? And are they both equally effective? Really what the most important thing is, is the SPF number. Okay. And so whether it's a lotion, a cream, a spray, a liquid, as long as you're putting on enough of the sunscreen and the SPF number is the same, then they're equal. The issue is maybe a spray and you're not spraying it on as thick of a layer as you would if you put a cream on. Mm -hmm. When they do the measurements for SPF, it's for a certain thickness of sunscreen that's going on and being rubbed into the skin for Mm -hmm. a given body surface area. So if you put on half the amount, well, then you're only getting half the amount of SPF in a sense. Or if you don't reapply enough. Yeah. So you have to make sure you put enough on. In the end, in terms of reapplying, if one is more likely to you know, you sweat and, you know, it comes off quicker, then it's a little less effective in that regard. But when you first apply it and put it on, if you put the same amount on of any of those given modalities of um, sunscreen, Mm -hmm. they should be equally effective. So what is the right amount of sunscreen? Obviously, it it depends on, you know, if you're an adult or it's a little, uh, you know, a kid. (laughs) But in general, for an adult, two to three tablespoons of sunscreen would be enough to apply over the whole body. Right. And then how much of that is for just your face? In general, a pea-sized amount or, you know, one or two pea-sized amount of creams is enough to cover the whole face. And I have read that actually if you do use spray sunscreen, most people don't use enough. So that's interesting to know. We think that maybe you just need a quick little spray Mm -hmm. over your arms, over your legs, but maybe you're missing it or you're getting streaks. And yeah, I think you're probably missing a lot more of the body if you're using that spray. Potentially, right? So it's important to be cognizant of how much you're spraying and to make sure you're applying it evenly over all the exposed areas. Right. Okay, so more on different kinds of sunscreen. There is waterproof sunscreen. What is the difference between waterproof sunscreen and regular sunscreen? And do I need to reapply it less often? Waterproof is a bit of a misnomer. We like to say water resistant Mm. because waterproof implies I could jump in the water. It's not coming off. Right. It's more resists water. It's water resistant. So the idea with those sunscreens is that they're a little bit thicker. They're less likely to wash off in water. Um, And what they'll say is that the SPF is maintained for up to 40 minutes okay. um, or 80 minutes, you know, depending on what their class, like how they classify um, or designate um, the water resistance okay. for that sunscreen. And so if you're swimming or sweating and you're wearing waterproof sunscreen, you still need to reapply that sunscreen after you get out of the water, correct? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, if, if you jump, if you're swimming, Um, pretty much you should reapply when you get out of the water because most of it will have come off. And when you're not swimming or sweating, how often do you need to reapply your sunscreen? So they say you should reapply every two hours. That might be a little bit high if you're not sweating and you're not swimming, like none of it has really come off. I think that might be a little excessive, but, you know, that's what some of the guidelines say. But Mm -hmm. I don't think it's so realistic to reapply every two hours. I mean, if someone's out, you know, a kid's at camp, are they putting sunscreen on four times a day? You know, it's it's not realistic to expect people to do that. That's true. And that's why we go back to that earlier point that just make sure you apply enough because if you only applied half as much as you should have initially, then you only have half the SPF in a sense. Mm -hmm. So make sure you put enough on the first time and then you reapply as needed. Okay, very good to know. So Dr. Levy, 
there are so many different kinds of sunscreens out there. Do they all use the exact same method or the same kinds of ingredients to shield our skin from the sun? No. So there's broadly, you can classify sunscreens as either chemical or physical, also known as mineral sunscreens. So you have chemical and then mineral. The way a mineral sunscreen works is it essentially acts like a mirror. So it reflects the UV radiation. So the sun hits your skin, you have mineral sunscreen on, and that mineral sunscreen reflects the UV radiation like a mirror off the skin. What's the ingredient that makes that happen in mineral sunscreen? So there's two main ingredients. There's zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. So mineral, there's only two. There's many for chemical. The way a chemical sunscreen works is the UV radiation hits your skin, and then the chemical sunscreen converts that UV radiation to heat, and then the heat just dissipates. So it's a totally different mechanism of action. And what are your thoughts on the difference between those two? Is one better? You know, what's the difference there? So it's... There's pros and cons so to, to each of them. So mineral sunscreens, because it's the zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, they tend to be thicker. So it sometimes leaves that a bit of a whitish residue or when you, it doesn't sort of rub into the skin as well, where you still see some you know whiteness on your skin. Now, some of these sunscreens now, they'll make them tinted. So okay. it's more of a little like a, a bit of a brownish color yeah. opposed to a white color. So when you rub it in, you don't have this white residue. It kind of blends in a little more. The chemical ones, the data is not fully out there. You know, there's some data that says maybe, maybe could this um, have other adverse effects on our health? We know that there's studies that show that some of the chemicals could be absorbed into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Now, just because something is absorbed in the bloodstream and it's there, it doesn't mean it's bad. It mm -hmm. just means it's inside of us. But right. that's expected. You put something on your skin. It's going to be it's, absorbed. It's, it's in our body. Yeah. Exactly. So what we do know is that sunscreens prevent skin damage and help prevent skin cancer. So could it maybe possibly have an adverse effect? Maybe, but we do know for sure it prevents skin cancer. So I think that outweighs it. Yeah. Um, over the years, there'll be new data, we'll see. But mm -hmm. for now, both sunscreens are considered safe to use. And so what about that common concept that sunscreen is bad for the oceans and for the environment? Have people asked you for a reef safe sunscreen or anything like that? It's thought that the, it could be damaging to the ocean, to coral reefs. And there's places like Hawaii that have banned certain ingredients of chemical sunscreens like oxybenzone. So in that sense, yeah, if you're going to be, you know, diving or snorkeling in the coral reefs or surfing there, use more of a mineral or physical blocker that has zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. And maybe some of the other chemicals are okay as well. I don't know all of them offhand in terms of which ones are reef safe, Yeah, um, but that information is all available online. Really interesting. So it's not just your personal preference. It's also what you'll be using it for, where you'll be. Everything is a factor. That's interesting. Definitely. Okay. So let's debunk some things here. Some people swear by using SPF 50 or more and will not wear anything below that. And some people stick to their SPF 15 and love it and won't go any higher. Can you break down the difference between those two. What's this debate about SPF? Do we need 30, 50, 15? What's interesting is what does the SPF number mean? So let's say take SPF 15, one five, okay? SPF 15 means you are getting one fifteenth the amount of UV radiation. So one fifteenth means you're getting 6.6%. So it's blocking 93.33% of the UV radiation, which is pretty good. That's pretty right? good. So now you go to say, all right, what's SPF 30? You're only getting 1 30th. So you're only getting 3.3%. So it's 96.6%. So SPF 15 to 30, you think it's double as strong, right? Because you think the number is double, but yeah. hold on. You're going from blocking 93.3% to 96.6%. Huh. Not such a big difference. It's only 3.3%, right? Yeah. Not double, right? So now you say, well, SPF 30 to 50, pretty big jump again, right? You would think. SPF 50, you're getting 1 50th. So you're only getting 2%. So it's blocking 98%. Wow. So SPF 30 to 50, you're going from 96.6 to 98. So you're only going up, it's only blocking an extra 1.3%. You can see there's not a huge difference there. Wow. Now let's say, let's go to SPF 60. Mm -hmm. It's 98.3. So you're going from 50 to 60 is 98 to 90.3. SPF 100. Yeah. Uh, if you know, there's not many of those out there, but that's blocking, you're getting one 100th, 99%. SPF 
50 to 100 is going from 98 to 99%. So a lot of math there, but it's just to show that um, once you get to the higher numbers, it doesn't matter anymore. So in some places, they, they want to make legislation to for marketing that once it's above 50, just this SPF 50 plus. Right. Because otherwise it's a little bit misleading. Someone's like, oh, I'm putting 100 on. It's double as good. No, not really. And it might give you that false sense of security. Maybe you might not feel like you have to reapply it because you, you think, oh, I use SPF 80. I'm good for the day. Exactly. So it can be a, a little bit misleading in a sense if you don't really know the the math and science behind it. And so what's your broad recommendation for what level of SPF people should be using? Is 30 generally, okay? Generally, I'll say 30 for the body, 50, 50 for the face. Okay. And that's more summertime, right? And the winters here, I think 15 to 30 is very sufficient. Okay, great. So they have a lot of different sunscreens out there that are just for the face. Is that something I really need to be investing in? Do I need a sunscreen for my body and a separate sunscreen for my face? For a lot of people, yes. And for some people, no. It's just like a moisturizer, right? There's moisturizers for your face. There's moisturizers for your body. Okay. In general, we'll use a moisturizer or sunscreen for the face. It's not going to be as thick so, because... We don't want something really thick and occlusive on our face because that can make people break out and cause acne. Mm -hmm. So often moisturizers or sunscreens that are for the face, it should say in little letters somewhere on the back, non-comedogenic, which means it's less likely to cause acne. It doesn't mean it won't, but it's just less likely to block your pores and make you break out. So some people, they say, I never get acne. You know, I don't mind using any product. Sure, you can use one on your face, like a body sunscreen on your face. But um, a lot of people, it just irritates their skin or, you know, makes them break out. So there I'd say, yes, use one for the face. So as a default recommendation, use a face sunscreen for your face. And so when you're using that face sunscreen, what order do you use it in terms of your whole skincare routine? Do you use it last? Do you use it after you apply? If you're applying makeup, when does that come in? You know, sometimes people, you know, they say, well, should I moisturize separately? I mean, you can get a moisturizer that has SPF in it. Yeah. Or your, just your sunscreen in general can just act as your moisturizer. So yeah. you don't need to do both of those. Just have a sunscreen or a moisturizing sunscreen. That'll do the trick. In terms of when, generally you say you can cleanse. If you're washing your face, wash your face first. And then if you're putting on maybe some antioxidants, that would go on first. And then you could put the sunscreen on afterwards. In terms of makeup, it depends, you know, what kind of makeup you're doing and, right. and, and, and what you're doing. And there are some makeups and there are some powders that have SPF in it. Oh, that's so cool. Some, and it comes like with a little brush. So it's easy to apply. But in other terms, treat your sunscreen like you would your moisturizer in your skincare routine. That'd be the simplest way to say it. Yes. Okay, great tip. And so say I do have very sensitive skin. I do want a separate sunscreen just for my face. Is there any brands or types in particular that you would recommend for sensitive skin? Yeah. So in general, you don't want to use anything that has any scent, fragrance, or lots of preservatives in it mm. because that people with sensitive skin are more likely to react to that. Doesn't mean they will, but they're more likely to. Yeah. Um, so there's several brands out there. We carry one here, Elta MD, which people love. Um, but there's other ones that you can just pick up elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, there's Aven, La Roche-Posay, um, Avino, I mean, it can go on and on. There's there's many out there that are sort of hypoallergenic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really just finding the one that you feel that works best for you. Okay. And last question. This is a hot topic. There's a big debate um, about using sunscreen on your hands before going to get your nails done. You know, when they use a UV lamp, does that really help with aging and sunspots? Can sunscreen help with damage on your hands? A UV lamp, I mean, we've been talking before about UV radiation, UVA, UVB. And so, yeah, if someone's shining UV radiation, it's essentially like a little mini sun coming down. Now, it might only be UVA, it doesn't have the UVB, but that is still damaging UV ultraviolet radiation wow. to your skin. So, because it was it was in the news just in the last couple months, I was reading about it. Yeah. And people were shocked, like, oh my God, I can't believe it's aging my skin. But of course, I mean, right. everyone knows, would you go to a tanning salon? What's a tanning salon? You go into bed, it's 95% UVA, about 5% UVB, and it's we know it's damaging to our skin. So 
yes, when we're doing this for nails, it's not as big of an area, you're not doing your whole body, but it's still for that skin there, it's damaging to the skin. So should people put sunscreen on for sure? I mean, ideally try to find a different treatment, but I've never had my nails done. So maybe this is great and people love it. So it is. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> um, but so if you're going to do it, protect your skin, all the, you know, what we were talking about before, just, uh, you know, put sunscreen, put SPF 50 on. That's great. I don't think that's something a lot of people think about before going to the nail salon. Right. And I mean, I don't know much about the whole nail industry, but I mean, that's something that I, in a perfect world, the the nail salon, they should put sunscreen on you. That should just be part of the treatment. That they should, should be part of the there, treatment. Right. Because you put it on before you go home and then you wash your hands once, then it's gone. Right. So they should put it on right before. They could totally work that in there. Yeah. This has been very interesting and eye opening. I don't think that people know these things about sunscreen and how important it is on a daily basis, no matter what you're doing, no matter what season it is to protect your skin on your face and your body from all sorts of things, aging, cancer, other things. It's very important. So thank you for breaking it down for us, Dr. Levy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Stay safe in the sun this summer and stay well, everyone. Take care. That was Dr. Jonathan Levy, the medical director of Refine, MedCan's dermatology clinic, in conversation with our managing producer, Jasmine Ratch. You can book a consultation with a refined dermatologist or esthetician by emailing refine at medcan.com or calling 416-350-3621. Follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLiveWell. We'll post episode highlights and other links that you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. Social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gerton, Andrew Imex, Emily Bozik, as well as Amanda Serafina James and Namanduta. Executive producer is me, Christopher Shulgin. We'll be back next week with an episode about fitness training. Answers to the questions fitness trainers get asked most. This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation for endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.